As I said, this video today is going to be about the first round of the French presidential election. There's been much discussion about this election over the last few weeks. And this is in some ways appropriate because, of course, France is one of the pivotal states of the European Union. It is the only European Union member state since Britain left, which is a nuclear power. It has significant armed forces. It has the second largest economy in the European Union after Germany. And for a very long time, it has been accepted that the, that the European Union operates as a kind of French-German axis. I would say that, in my opinion, the last is a little overstated, at least in the last few years. There's been increasing stresses between France and Germany under the surface for some time. And it has seemed to me that, especially under um, the presidency of Emmanuel Macron, the French... Uh, have been quietly working to set up a kind of Latin axis alongside Italy and other Latin-speaking states like Spain to counterbalance, to some extent, the Germans. But overall, it's fair to say that France and Germany are the two, still very much the two, big powers in the European Union, and the European Union goes where they go. If France were to radically change its policies, it, if it were to generally break with the Atlanticist consensus that has dominated European politics, or at least EU politics, since the end of the Cold War, then things would change radically, both within the European Union and also within NATO as well. So people have been always very interested in the way in which the French elections go. And, of course, there is the other factor, which is that France has a politics that is, to some extent, different from the politics of other countries. In France, revolution, or the concept of revolution, which is regarded with great suspicion in countries like Britain and Germany, in France, the concept of revolution, because of the revolutionary tradition going back to 1789, is accepted and even mainstream, and that has perhaps inclined the French to consider, contemplate voting for parties which they might not have voted, which might not get similar support in other countries. And <clears throat> this now brings me directly to the, to the latest election outcome. Now, I've now got what I believe to be the final results of the first round. <clears throat> and they give um, Emmanuel Macron as the leader, 27.60% of the vote, um, Marine Le Pen, 23.41%, and Jean-Luc Jean Mélenchon, 21, who leads the left, or what remains of the French left, we'll talk about that in a moment, 21.95%. And we see after uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, the fourth candidate was Eric Zemmour, the fiery right-winger, who got 7.05. Then there's a scattering of votes that, um, for various leaders beyond that, including Valérie Pécresse, uh, who leads the Republicans, once the dominant party in France. She only got 4.79 and Anne Hidalgo, the Socialist Party candidate, she only managed to get 1.74. As an extraordinary result, French Socialist Party refounded in, I believe, 1969 by Francois Mitterrand, was for decades the dominant party in France, and it can look back to a tradition in French politics in the left, going all the way back through um, Pierre Mendes, France, all the way back to Jean Jaurès in the late 19th century. So this is an incredible implosion um, on the part of Anne Hidalgo, I would uh, and the Socialists, uh, 1.74. They're now, in truth, a completely marginal force in French life. In fact, they've polled below 
Fabien Roussel and the French Communist Party, once the rival with the Socialists for leadership of the French left. Um, the French Communist Party also once a mighty force in French life, also once looking back to um, the inspiration of Jean Jaurès in the, in the late 19th century. It polled 2.31%, still more than the Socialist Party, but also um, indicating that in electoral terms at least, the French Communist Party remains a marginal force. It's clear that French, the French left is reviving, but it is crystallising, it is concentrating around the personality of Jean-Luc Mélenchon and his La France Insoumise, which is clearly now the new vehicle of the left-wing tradition in France. So the result of this election is that uh, the second round will now be a straight contest, contest between Emmanuel Macron and Marine Le Pen. Now, there's a number of things I'm going to say here, first of all, which is that um, it had seen for a long time over the course of this election that Marine Le Pen, who is somebody who gets consistently labelled in much of the Western media and indeed in France itself as an extreme right winger, winger as a fascist, uh, as a racist, as all sorts of things, um, it's clear that the attempt to sideline her in this election um, has failed. Now, this perhaps requires a certain amount of discussion, and I'm going to make an observation that I've made before, and which has encountered some resistance. But a few months ago, it did seem as if um, Marine Le Pen was at real risk of being sidelined by the fiery right-winger Eric Zemmour, who briefly looked as if he might overtake her as the leader of what people in people who discuss French politics like to call the far right. Now, I'm going to repeat again that I've always been a little sceptical about Eric Zemmour. I don't in any way deny the sincerity of his beliefs or the fact that he genuinely did seek to be elected president of France. But an individual who is known mainly from his appearances on French television, who's essentially a journalist, who has no party or organisation behind him, always seemed to me a somewhat unlikely individual to lead the French right. And I have to say that it did seem to me that his entry into politics, into French politics, into this election, was being facilitated to a degree which perhaps he himself did not realise by powerful French media groups, which were giving him an extraordinary amount of attention and were in effect building him up as a credible alternative to the historic leader of the French right, or at least of the French hard right, who was Marine Le Pen. And I have to say this, I still believe that the real purpose of launching Eric Zemmour was to divide the hard right and perhaps facilitate Emmanuel Macron's eventual victory and perhaps also make it possible for Valérie Pécresse as leader of the Republicans, which is the traditional party of the French centre-right, to uh, storm through and perhaps face uh, Macron in the second round. Well, if that was the plan, and I rather think it was, it has largely failed. I say largely failed because if you put together uh, Marine Le Pen's 23.41% uh, of the vote with um, Eric Zemmour's 7.05, mathematically, if Zemmour had not run, then on the assumption that um, Le Pen would have held on to all of her vote and Zemmour, uh, Zemmour's vote would have gone in a block to uh, Marine Le Pen, then 
Marine Le Pen would have won more than 30% of the vote, in which case she would have come out as the winner of the first round, surpassing Macron at 27.60. Now, I want to make clear this is hypothetical and to some extent realistic. We can never be sure what the dynamic of the election would have been if Zimmer would not have run. And we mustn't make the assumption that um, the vote for Le Pen would have been the same at 23.41 uh, um, 23 um, um, and that she would have got all of Zimmer's vote at 7.05. It's possible that if Zimmer had not run, it would have been easier for uh, Macron to uh, label um, Le Pen as far right. That might have made it more difficult for Le Pen to get soft uh, right votes, which might otherwise have gone to either Macron or conceivably Pécresse, and we could have had completely different numbers. But nonetheless, the fact that, Ma uh, that uh, Le Pen and Zemmour's combined vote exceeds Macron's ought to be a cause for concern for people who continue to support Macron. And I'm going to say straight away that it seems to me that the overall, the final result, um, despite some exceptionally heavy spinning that has been going on on the part of some people in the commentariat, the mainstream commentariat, should provoke unease amongst the French establishment. I would have said that 27.6 for Macron is actually on the low side, definitely very much on the low side, given that he's the incumbent seeking re-election in this election. Um, quite apart from the fact that Marine Le Pen's vote and that of Eric Zemmour, uh, the, the aggregate vote of these two candidates, exceeds Macron's, he's also got to consider that the, the outcome of the election now depends very heavily on the vote, the way the vote of Jean-Luc Mélenchon, who is now the undisputed and unchallenged leader of the French left, and by the way, the person who is now actively rebuilding the French left as the old parties, the French Communist Party and the French Socialist Party, head towards oblivion. Um, it all now depends on how Mélenchon's uh, vote goes. I say that because the voters who will definitely go, who will definitely support uh, Macron in the second round, those of the Republicans and of the Socialists, really don't add very much ultimately to Macron's total. They would come together, they would amount to around 6% of the vote, and that would leave him far below, at around 33%, 34% of the vote, far below where he needs to be if he is to be confident of winning the second round in um, two weeks' time. So this is going to be a very tough election, or at least it's going to be an election in which Mélenchon's vote the 22%, which is 21.95%, almost 22% that Mélenchon got, which is far above what anybody had expected before the election. It's all going to depend very much on how these people vote, or if they don't vote, whether they abstain. If there's a mass abstention of all of Mélenchon's voters, and that seemed to be what he was advising them all to do yesterday, when he did not endorse Macron, but said that none of them should vote for Le Pen. Well, in that case, um, it's difficult to see how Macron, Macron might struggle 
to win. But of course, if they don't abstain, if they split, if some of them, as has seemed possible, vote for Le Pen, then it might be very difficult for Macron to get re-elected. However, having said that, I must say that I still find it very structurally very difficult to imagine any kind of situation where voters in France who vote for a left-wing party like uh, um, Mélenchon's La France Insoumise or indeed the French Social Communist Party with its 2.31% would bring themselves to vote for somebody that they've been told is a far right winger like uh, Le Pen. Le Pen, in my opinion, has consistently faced this structural difficulty. In terms of her economic policies, she's actually very close in some respects to Mélenchon's views. In terms of her foreign policies, or what we know about them, She's also, in some ways, fairly close to Mélenchon's views. She's also sceptical about the EU, sceptical about NATO. You would have thought that it would not be difficult for left-wing voters in France who support people like uh, Mélenchon and the French communist Rousseau to transfer their vote to Le Pen. She is logically closer to them in policy than than uh, um, Macron is and one would have expected or thought that it would be very difficult logically for those voters to vote for somebody, a neoliberal figure, like um, Macron. Nothing unfortunately in France is that straightforward. I have to say that the thing always to understand about France is that French politics tend to be dominated to a degree that is simply impossible for outsiders to understand by the two great, sh the two long shadows, um, the, the long shadows of the two great events in French history. The first is the, the French Revolution of 1789, which shaped French politics up to and beyond the Second World War. And the second is the Second World War itself. Those two events make it exceptionally difficult for French left-wing voters to break through and to vote for someone like Le Pen, who they have been told is somebody who identifies or is labelled as far-right. Now, in saying that, I'm going to repeat my long-standing view that in Le Pen's case, her policies, her politics, in fact, resemble much more closely those of Charles de Gaulle, who was the uh, president of France in the 1960s. Like de Gaulle, she has a sceptical view of immigration. Like de Gaulle, she believes in dirigiste economic policies, which, by the way, are the policies that one would expect would appeal to left-wing voters. Like de, de Gaulle, she was sceptical of the European Union, or at least of the integrationist moves within the European Union. And she was, and like de Gaulle, she's also hostile to NATO, has some willingness to work with the Russians, or at least suggested that in the past. Whether as president she really would is another matter, but we'll leave that for another day. And, of course, like de Gaulle, she's also had some scepticism towards the United States. De Gaulle could get away with all of that, could attract voters from all sides of French society, could overcome the kind of divisions in ways that Le Pen has struggled to do, because despite numerous attempts to paint, uh, to label De Gaulle as a fascist, something which used to happen quite a lot, by the way, in the 1950s, and still persisted in the 1960s, it was never in the end really possible to do that because, of course, he had led the anti-fascist resistance during the Second World War and had formed a uh, national unity government which included the French Communist Party um, after the liberation of France in 
in the 1940s. So it was never really easy, it was never really possible to label de Gaulle in that way, though I should say that there were numerous attempts to do so. And of course, de Gaulle was a titanic figure, he was a giant in French politics and French society, he was an aristocrat, he was able to transcend differences and overcome these structural problems in ways that Le Pen has up to now been unable to do. Having said that, I'm also going to say this. It does seem to me that if Le Pen is going to break through, she's closer to doing it in this election than she has ever done it in any other of the many elections she has fought up to now. These structural problems, which I've talked about, have never been as brittle an obstacle to her winning the French election as they are today. And the reasons for this are threefold. Firstly, I think that there is a massive groundswell of unease in France at the way in which France has been um, bundled onto the runaway train of anti-Russian sanctions, of support for Ukraine, of support for the for um, uh, NATO, as uh, um, uh, which is what uh, as um, has happened over the last few months, and as Macron has managed to achieve. Macron has been an enthusiast for anti-Russian sanctions. He seems to be supporting every single conceivable move that has been taken by the. Um, um, uh, NATO and Western leadership and given French history that's almost guaranteed to provoke real unease in France. Then of course on top of all of that there is the economic crisis, the cost of living crisis which by the way at the moment is less severe in France than it is in some other places because France gets so much of its energy from nuclear power there hasn't been this huge surge in energy costs that we're seeing in other places. So whilst inflation rate, the inflation rate is running at just under 10% in Spain and 12% in the Netherlands and around probably 8% in Germany, given some churning in the figures. In France, it's more like 5 to 6%. But 5 to 6% inflation is already high by historic standards, or at least by recent standards, and of course it comes on top of real pressure on French living standards for some time. And of course this brings us back to the many comments and observations I've been making and we've been making on the Duran about Macron for some time. He's aloof, he's arrogant, he's extremely conceited, he still gives this impression of believing himself to be the cleverest person in the room. In fact, what he comes across all the time is as the cleverest boy in the class, or at least the person who thinks he's the cleverest boy in the class, but who is extraordinarily inept in getting on with the other children in the class. And I think that this is grating increasingly on French society, and all of these factors taken together explain his relatively low vote as a incumbent president seeking re-election, which is 27.6. It's better than the dismal polling figures that Francois Hollande was showing at the same just before um, he might have sought re-election, but given how um, powerful the figure Macron has been in French politics over the last few years since his election, I must say I think 27.6 for him is disappointing and it shows the accumulated resentments and anger that there has been towards him. And of course, if you supported, if you're French and you should supported the Gilets Jaunes, well, you might feel particularly angry at the highly authoritarian policies that Macron pursued against the Gilets Jaunes and which he also pursued during the period of the pandemic. And besides French society,
doesn't very much like his neoliberal economic policies, which Marine Le Pen and Jean-Luc Mélenchon, both in their different ways, or rather actually their rather similar ways, seek to repudiate. So, though I think that the structural problems that still stand in Le Pen's way probably mean that in the end Macron is going to win the second round. I don't think it is as certain an outcome as it might once have been. And in fact, I think that the opinion polls would suggest that um, look, uh, Macron has a fight on his hands and might in fact still lose. I think those suggestions might very well be true. The last time there was a big upset in a French election, the last time things really went catastrophically wrong, not just for the incumbent, but for the entire French establishment, or so we thought at the time, the election which perhaps in some ways resembles this one most closely, in my opinion, is the French election of 1981, which the French socialist François Mitterrand unexpectedly won against the similarly arrogant, aloof, out-of-touch, complacent uh, Valérie Giscard d'Estaing, the centrist um, establishment figure and incumbent president, who, as I remember before the, the election, everybody assumed was go going to win. And if we go to the elections, the first round results in that election, we see that Gis Giscard in, got 28.32, slightly more than um, um, uh, Macron has won in this election, and that um, François Mitterrand, the socialist, got 25.85%. Again, more than Le Pen. But note that in that election, Jacques Chirac, who was on the right, um, um, but a hostile to Giscard, got 18%, and Georges Marchais for the communists got 15.35%. So the assumption then was that um, the Chiracians, Chirac supporters, would all support Giscard, in the second round, and that Marche's communist supporters would all go to um, Mitterrand, but that since uh, Chirac supporters outnumbered Marche's, and since Giscard had outpolled um, Mitterrand by a very similar margin to the one we've just seen between, um, between uh, Man Macron and Le Pen, that ultimately Giscard would win in the second round. And I remember the astonishment, the utter um, bewilderment across French society, and by the way, the euphoria, when it turned out that it was actually Mitterrand who won, that Mitterrand actually won the election, getting 51.76 over Giscard's 48.24. Now that result, um, that result in the 1981 second round is very similar to what some of the opinion polls have been saying in terms of the second round of this election, putting either Macron or Le Pen ahead by a similar margin of difference in the second round to the one that we saw that decided the outcome in the second round in the 1981 election. So it's just possible that we could see a similar upset in this election to the one which we saw in 1981. I'm not expecting it. I didn't, I don't expect um, Le Pen to win. I think the structural problems that stand in her way are too great. But then I have to say, I thought the same in 1981. I thought in 1981 that despite uh, Mitterrand's strong showing, that the structural problems that would stand in the way 
of him winning in the second round would be too great. I couldn't believe that Chirac supporters would turn out and vote for Mitterrand, of all people, that right-wing voters would vote not for a centrist like uh, uh, Macron, uh, like, sorry, like, uh, uh, like Sh uh, Giscard, but would actually vote for a left-winger, or so we believed him to be, like Mitterrand, and nonetheless it happened. So it's not impossible that we could see something like that happening again this time. So my conclusion, um, I still think uh, Macron is likely to win. I'm not so sure this time. I think that there's a chance. I certainly think that Le Pen is in with a chance. It depends how she conducts the election over the next two weeks. It can, depends very much, ultimately, on what Mélenchon's voters do. We shall see what happens. What I will say is this, and this is where I'm going to finish. If Le Pen does break through and does become president, then strictly in terms of French politics and putting entirely to one side the global implications, this will be a result, this would be, in that case, a result that bookends a period of French politics. The French politics that we know, uh, the kind of French political system that we see, the kind of style in French politics, really is the style of French politics that Mitterrand created as president when he won that election in 1981. He remained the incumbent president for years and years. He recreated French politics in his own, I think, deeply cynical style. And the political figures who have followed him, um, people like Sarkozy, uh, um, even Chirac, um, um, Hollande, and of course Macron, are to a great extent his successors. They are people who follow very much in the footsteps of Mitterrand. And that was because Mitterrand brought to French politics his own cynical style and it has pervaded and affected the way French politics works. If Le Pen wins in two weeks' time, that era of French politics the era of Francois Mitterrand will have come to an end. Well, I'm not predicting it. I'm not anticipating it. I still expect 